WCCO, television for the great Northwest. From Beyond, with your host, Dan Witkowski. It was quite some time, the ragtime era. Will Rogers spinning his rope along with his famous tales. Jolson on one knee crooning to his mammy. And Zigfield presenting his American beauties on the stages of the Great White Way. Entertainment in abundance, yet one performer never failed to pack the vaudeville theaters throughout the world. An entertainer who built his career around the entire dream of every modern man, Escape. The master magical showman of all time, Harry Houdini. Of course, Houdini was not your average run-of-the-mill rabbit-out-of-the-hat magician or escape artist, for Houdini accepted challenges. Challenges to some of the most daring escape feats ever presented. They say there was never a lock made he couldn't spring, or a pair of handcuffs he couldn't manage to wiggle out of. Nothing could hold Houdini. He escaped from dungeons, straitjackets, chains, sealed coffins, underwater graves, riveted boilers, even from the gallows. And because his feats were so unexplainable, many believed he was indeed a man from beyond who supposedly possessed supernatural powers to accomplish his entertaining impossibilities. Yes, it all took place when ragtime was magic, and magic was Houdini, the man from beyond and master of escape. Daddy, how much is six and one fourth times twelve and two thirds? Sarah, I'll prove to you my daddy's a genius. Seventy-nine and one-sixth, honey. This Casio is the only calculator in the world that works fractions, and it has two memories. How many days since I was born? It even figures out dates. You were born uh, 3,652 days ago on Sunday. See, I told you my daddy's a genius. Anybody can be a genius with a Casio AL8S, and only Casio has it. I'm Marge Melby, one of the million adults participating in adult education in Minnesota this year. I went to college, but I've realized education is more than just school. Since graduation, I've studied theater, interior design, even skiing. And I've decided learning helps make life worth living. No matter what your reasons are, participate in adult education. Take it from me. Whether you're 18 or 80, you're never too old to learn. Having spent most of his youth in Appleton, Wisconsin, Houdini had the urge for performing early in life. At age 17, Harry and his younger brother Theo set out performing their feats of magic and escapes in small circuses and sideshows throughout the Midwest. While performing at New York's Coney Island, Harry met and married his future stage assistant, Bess Rodner. Brother Theo had decided to attempt a stage career on his own and left the couple to tour as an escape artist under the professional name of Hardeen. The early years were lean for the young Houdinis, having to perform their magic act in cheap saloons and second-rate dance halls. But it was a hall of this type in St. Paul, Minnesota, where they were awarded their first major performing contract. Martin Beck, booker for the Orpheum Vaudeville Circuit, offered Harry and Bess a few trial dates in the Midwest with the stipulation that Houdini would make his handcuff escapes, accepting challenges from all comers, the feature of the show. Houdini, a promoter from the start, began to capitalize on his unique talents. Although he would have the local police departments in the cities where he was appearing lock him in a half dozen set of their finest handcuffs, he would always manage to free himself within a few short minutes. One police force challenged Houdini by fitting him with a regulation straitjacket used to restrain the criminally insane. Houdini slipped out of the garment as if he were removing a topcoat. 
Harry would later make his escapes from scores of straitjackets while dangling several stories off the ground and upside down from flagpoles attached to buildings. said to be the most significant effect that gained Houdini praise and attention as a master showman. By 1900, Houdini had become one of the most sought-after vaudeville performers on this continent. Eager to travel abroad, Harry and Beth set sail for England, where the elusive American made worldwide headlines by escaping from maximum security restraints at the internationally famous law enforcement agency, Scotland Yard. Houdini was breaking worldwide attendance records throughout Europe when he decided to return to the States in the spring of 1904. It was during an engagement in Washington, D.C. that Houdini he performed one of his most amusing escape stunts. The officials at the Warren Federal Jail challenged the escapologist to free himself from an area within their prison. When Houdini accepted the challenge, he was stripped, stark naked, thoroughly searched for any concealed pick devices, and then he was locked in a cell block on Murderer's Row that once confined Charles J. Gautio, the assassin of President Garfield. Working swiftly, Houdini freed himself within two minutes and then broke into the cell where his clothing had been locked up. He then proceeded to release from their cells all the prisoners from the ground floor, rearranging the convicts. He changed the housing plan for the entire cell block. Houdini, completely dressed, knocked on the warden's door in less than 21 minutes after his original confinement. Although many thousands saw Houdini perform during his worldwide tours, there are few today who knew him as a close friend. One of Houdini's associates, having written many accounts of the magician's life, is Mr. Walter Gibson, who resides in upstate New York. The original Houdini scrapbook is the latest venture in magic writing by Walter Gibson, but only uh, the latest of six editions on Houdini. Walter is a confidant, probably the only living confidant of Harry Houdini, and also a well-known author of The Shadow, The Shadow Knows. And it was during your shadow years that you first met Harry Houdini, correct, Walter? No, I met him before that. I met him earlier, and in fact, it was my um, uh, acquaintance with Houdini and knowledge of his methods that more or less led me into writing The Shadow later. And uh, uh, I first met him, oh, three or four years before he died. And uh, I went up to his house, and because I was a practicing magician as well as a newspaper man, and I went up to talk with him about doing articles about him. And from then on, I met him quite frequently. From then on, you also, uh, well, you wrote uh, Houdini on Magic for Harry Houdini, uh, right. Houdini's Escapes, uh, many books that have become a classic in every magician's library. But even more than that, uh, you produced uh, many of the publicity things for the Houdini show. What were, as far as uh, Houdini being a publicist, they say his, some of his most famous uh, feats were simple magic tricks that any magician would perform, but it was his showmanship that really made the man. Oh, definitely. You see, he, he did two things that were very unusual. In the New York Hippodrome, where I saw him perform, he did two tricks. One was the needle trick, where he presumably swallowed a lot of needles and brought them out threaded from his mouth. Now imagine he did that in the stage of the largest theater in New York. A very small trick like that? Yes, except you could see those needles because the spotlight hit them and they shone and uh, as he drew out the, the needles on the thread, you could see them glittering all the way along the line. But on that same sh stage, in another season, he produced the largest illusion that was ever performed, the vanishing elephant. He put an elephant in the cabinet and vanished it completely before the entire audience. That's right, on the same stage. So he had both the smallest and the largest That's tricks right. in magic ever performed. Absolutely. As far as the magic, uh, he's known probably uh, even more so for his famous escapes. Anything from handcuffs, any shackles That's made. Right. But as far as the most dramatic stage presentation. Well, his water torture cell was unquestionably the most dramatic 
That was where he was lowered upside down into a cell filled with water with a glass front. His feet were locked in a pair of stocks that formed the cover for the cell. And you could see him there upside down, co completely immersed in water when they lowered curtains around him. And three minutes later, he came out dripping wet. They hoisted the curtains and there was the cell intact, all padlocked, just as he had gone in. But not only was that effect an, uh, an interesting illusion as far as the escape, but also a very dangerous item, I understand. Absolutely, and to prepare for it, he used to immerse himself in a b big bathtub in his home every morning to see how much longer he could stay underwater. And he kept, I think he probably had at his time pretty much the world record for staying underwater. He was tremendously physically fit. That's right. Was he not? Yes, he was always in physical training. And that, of course, was, helped him in his escapes when he jumped off of bridges. He would jump off of bridges handcuffed and come up with the, with the cuffs all free. He made a jump in, in Minneapolis that, uh, that was quite dangerous, I understand, of a similar bridge jump of that type. Yes, because he didn't realize what he was running into. He did it in winter. And sometimes he'd jump off when there was ice in the river. This time the river was frozen completely and they had to cut a hole for him to go in. He went down under, came up, and found himself under the ice. Well, he worked his way back by breathing between the water level and the, and the crust of ice above and found the hole and came out. Now, these stunts that he would perform during the bridge jumps, his, uh, his famous escapes, were not part of the evening show, but were simply publicity getters to let the people know Houdini was in town. That's right. That was a great secret of his success. That was where you came in an awful lot. You wrote many of the stories. and Oh, yes, definitely. And uh, I was writing his last stories when he died. I had just finished an article on his most dangerous escapes, and it was published just after his death. It was the last interview ever with Houdini. What was probably the most dangerous, other than maybe the, uh, the bridge incident? Were there any others that defied death a little bit? Well, there was one in Germany. He decided to be tied to a railroad track, and he was waiting for a train to come along. And he had ropes around his arms and ropes around his ankles, and he was tied across the track. And he knew he had time to get free. And he worked out, and he was almost free except for his ankles, when the train came around the bend five minutes ahead of time. He rolled over to his side, managed to pull his ankles down, and the train came along and cut the ropes, binding his ankles. And it was on the side away from the spectators who were below the hill looking up. And when the train went by, they thought Houdini was a goner. Instead, he was standing there taking a bow. That was Houdini. take off for the great outdoors, I want a great pair of boots like these. Real leather uppers, foam insulation, padded collar, Goodyear welt, steel shank, and oil resistant sole. Kmart's price only $15. Save over one third now through Saturday, October 30th. Kmart is the saving place. On November 2nd, this will be the scene in our Television 4 studios. Dozens of people, phones, computers, all working to bring you the returns on more than 100 congressional, legislative, and local races quickly and completely. Control data through its CyberNet services system, joining WCCO Television again this year, providing the magic technology of its Cyber 173 computers to speed the returns to you. Computer vote total, an election night exclusive, here on Channel 4. Although magic and escapes may have dominated Houdini's career, he also proved to be a pioneer in quite a diverse variety of other fields. Having followed the development of aviation from the time the Wright brothers made history near Kitty Hawk, Houdini was determined to conquer a new horizon, the sky. Knowing that no one had yet flown the airs over Australia, Houdini purchased a Vossen biplane in Germany, practiced flying it over an army parade ground, dismantled it, and packed it for shipping to Melbourne. On March 16, 1910, Houdini became the first man to soar the skies of the Australian continent. Back in the States, the cinema was providing some tough competition for the vaudeville stage, and long before sophisticated production techniques and camera trickery became routine, 
the silent screen was featuring the antics of the pioneer daredevil. Houdini established himself as one of Hollywood's original stuntmen as he performed for the cameras in five major movie serials. The escapes featured in his first film in 1918 used authentic sets and props that provided a real threat to the magician's life. In The Master Mystery, Houdini struggles to free himself from the bonds of ropes or face a tortured death in a boiling cauldron of acid. that Houdini would be a surefire hit with the movie-going audience, Hollywood producer Jesse Lasky signed The Magician for two Paramount aircraft films, Terror Island and The Grim Game. Despite extensive promotional campaigns for both movies, neither were tremendously successful at the box office. Although they were filled with spectacular escapes and stunts, the word had spread Houdini was no actor. Determined he could produce the type of film the public wanted to see, Harry formed the Houdini Picture Corporation in 1921. The company's first movie, The Man from Beyond, was written, starred, and produced by Houdini. The most memorable of all his films, the plot deals with spiritualism and reincarnation, subjects that had not even been considered by other producers of the day. The Man from Beyond also features one of the most dangerous escape stunts ever captured on film. Houdini himself performed the nerve-jarring rescue scene on the rapids of Niagara Falls. second effort, Paul Dane of the Secret Service, lacked the thrill and the excitement of its predecessor and proved to be a financial burden. The Houdini Motion Picture Corporation was disbanded in 1923. Houdini's evening show in the mid-1920s featured a new act that soon became a hit with the vaudeville audiences. Besides presenting the already proven feats of magic and escape, Houdini presented a segment on the expose of fraudulent spiritual mediums. For years after the death of his beloved mother, Houdini visited scores of mediums throughout the world with hopes that he might be able to communicate with her spirit. Frustrated by hope mediums who use cheap trick methods to produce spiritualistic manifestations, Houdini set forth an all-out campaign against their fraudulent tactics. In 1922, Houdini joined a committee from the Scientific American magazine who offered a reward of $2,500 for any physical phenomena produced by a medium under rigidly controlled conditions, plus an additional $2,500 for any spirit photographs taken under the same test conditions. Houdini then topped this offer with $5,000 of his own. One of the strongest contenders for this award was Marjorie Crandon, the blonde witch of Boston, whose spiritual manifestations had no logical explanations, at least until Houdini was called in. After attending several seances in the, the medium's Beacon Hill residence, Houdini was quick to detect her insidious tricks. The bell that rang, the megaphone that was levitated, and the table that mysteriously floated off the ground were given logical explanations after being viewed through the eyes of a magician whose business, after all, was deceiving people. When Houdini challenged Marjorie to a series of seances under his test conditions, alas, no spirits appeared. 
Despite his campaigns against the outright frauds, Houdini did not deny the religion of spirituality, nor did he say that the dead could not return. He never discarded the possibility that even he might be able to contact the living world after his own death. It was this thought of returning from the afterworld that Houdini made a pact with his wife Bess. Together they worked out a code, a code that would let Bess know that it was indeed Houdini. Houdini died in 1926, and for two years following, Bess had a standing offer of $10,000 to any medium who could produce the secret message that Houdini had arranged with her. Bess was besieged by spiritualists from all over the world, claiming to have contacted the departed Houdini. The most notable of these was Reverend Arthur Ford, who, although broke the code, did not satisfy Bess in believing that the contact with her husband was valid. After years of unsuccessful attempts, it was suggested that a final seance be held on Halloween, October 31st, 1936, the 10th anniversary of Houdini's death. Over 200 invitations were sent to a select group of magicians, spiritualists, movie celebrities, and members of the press. The rooftop of the Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood was the setting. On a table in front of the crowd sat a slate and a piece of chalk, a bell, a trumpet, and two pairs of the magician's handcuffs. Through these instruments, it was hoped that the spirit of Houdini would communicate. On that cold, damp night in October, Dr. Edward Saint, longtime friend of the Houdini family, called upon the spirit to manifest itself. Houdini, are you here? Are you here, Houdini? Please manifest yourself in any way possible. Bessie is here. Your Bessie, who was part of you for 33 years. It means so much to her, to all of us, to the world. The world is listening. Harry, your world, your audience, take from this earnest gathering any strength that may be necessary for you to use. Take any vital thing from us that you may need to enable you to carry out your promise of years ago. We have waited, Houdini, oh so long. We are watching and waiting, Harry. Levitate the table, move it. Lift the table, move it, wrap on it. Spell out a code, Harry, please. Do it, Harry, please. We gave the Betty Crocker Kitchens Hamburger Helper and asked them to create the best oven casseroles they ever tasted. Baked lasagna a la Lois. Oh. Oven stroganoff Lorraine. Oh. 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 Jane's chili tamale casserole. Oh. <laughs> now there's an oven casserole recipe on every box of Hamburger Helper, tested in the Betty Crocker Kitchens, so you can make delicious oven casseroles with Hamburger Helper, a few simple ingredients, and a little imagination. <laughs> Wednesday night at 6.30, we bring you a pre-Halloween treat for youngsters from 7 to 70. If you like chills and thrills along with your giggles, don't miss the Laurel and Hardy murder case from the year 1930. You'll see it this Wednesday night at 6.30. John Gallus inviting you to join us just for laughs. The human mind is fascinating. It has brought us from the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk to the surface of the moon in less than 70 years. I know, I've been there. But fascinating as the mind may be, it is not immune to illness, minor temporary stresses, and more serious emotional upsets. But help is available. I know, I've been there too. I'm Buzz Aldrin, your National Mental Health Chairman. I don't have to tell you that we're in a new age in space technology, but my message is a reminder that we're also in a new age in mental health care. You can help through your understanding and concern, and you really can make a difference by supporting your local mental health association. 
Although a half century has passed since the handcuff king graced the stages of the world, the legend that surrounds the great mystifier continues to entertain. Both the movie and the television industry captured his life and his amazing antics in full-length feature films. The London Theatre dramatized the escapologist's career in a magical, musical comedy production in the 1960s. And Houdini was the first magician to be honored by the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, with a star bearing his name placed in the Entertainer's Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. And just a few short blocks from the site where he performed his daring rescue scene in the rapids of the Niagara Falls, the Houdini Magical Hall of Fame is dedicated as a tribute to his uncanny accomplishments as a master entertainer. Although it is said that he was a man who could walk through walls, release himself from a score of handcuffs, and penetrate the bars of any prison cell around, Houdini could not escape the inevitable. Houdini died on October 31st, 1926, a date which is still honored in his memory by magicians throughout the country as the National Day of Magic. On the crisp November morning of his burial, hundreds of friends, fans, and associates crowded the cemetery to pay tribute to the man who so often had entertained them. And long after his coffin had been sealed, lowered in the ground, and covered with earth, a crowd of skeptics lingered around the gravesite, waiting, just in case.